Um, so yeah, I'm Steve Stops. I'm founder of a, a tiny little mobile team in the UK called Lumo Developments. There are four of us, including me. Um, and today we're going to talk about the word trust, the importance of trust, and by trusting people what you get from it. And we'll also be looking at the shape, square, triangle, and circle. Um, so first of all, the team itself, we've only just, in fact, yesterday launched our first game as a team. So it's unsurprising you've never heard of us. But we've been together making games as a team for quite a while. We used to work for a big game studio with about 230 people in it, making console titles like Epic Mickey 2 and those kind of things. Um, and we had an interesting journey there because a bunch of years ago, um, we were finished an experimental project with Google, and we didn't have a new project to work on. It was often the case in Work for Hire Studios, you get like a little bit of downtime, and sometimes in that downtime, you shuffle paperwork, you hide in the corner, you spend your time on Facebook or Twitter or whatever else you want to do. We decided not to do that. We decided that we'd start making games. So I had an artist, a programmer, and a designer, and we made our first little game in about 12 weeks. Um, kind of unbeknownst to the studio until we went, oh, we made this, and then they put it out. And I'll tell you a bit about what happened in a minute. But mostly my talk is going to be about how to manage teams, how to instill trust, and then over the last slides, I'll go through in quite critical detail our last eight months as a team and what's gone well and what hasn't gone so well, and bring you into some of our secrets of what we do as a team. Um, we've been quite successful in lots of ways. So this is my team. Um, there are five people in the picture, because I include Chris as our team. So I've got Chris Allen here, who's our programmer. He's our kind of quiet technical genius, sits in the corner, actually makes stuff work. Nick is one of the most phenomenal artists and art directors I've ever worked with. Um, he was the person I was super excited to have as part of our team. As we go through the presentation, I'll show you some of his work, and hopefully you'll understand why um, I rave about him so much. In the middle, Jonathan Evans, who's probably one of the only game designers that I choose to work with on a regular basis. He has no ego and makes all the game about the player, and we'll talk about that a lot. Chris Randall, who's technically not part of the full-time team, he's our audio guy, but audio is important, um, and he's made a big difference to our game. He's a freelance audio guy. If you ever need audio for a game, go to Chris Randall. Um, if you Google his name, he'll come up. He's amazing. We had a 15-minute conversation with him where we said, we're making a game that's a bit like this, we want it to sound a bit like this. And it's like he read our minds and then came back with the exact audio we all had in our heads but couldn't describe. And that's me at the end. I'm kind of the business and producer guy. I do all of the stuff that isn't the cool creative stuff so my guys can get on and do the amazing creative thing. So let's start about trust. I, I had a belief for a long, long time. Simple belief that if you get a group of creative people who you believe are talented, and I believe this lot are phenomenally talented, and trust them to do amazing stuff, good things will come of it. And I really put my money where my mouth was at the beginning of this year because I managed to secure £150,000 worth of investment to get the game. I pulled the game team out of the studio and gave them jobs. And then when I set the company up, I gave everyone completely equal shareholding in the company. So technically, whilst I'm here today talking to you guys, they could be having a meeting, go, you know, that Steve's a bit rubbish, we'll sack him, and they could sack me while I'm here. Everyone has completely equal shareholding. Everyone told me not to do this. They said, you should at least have one or two extra percent yourself in case it really comes down to it, you can override them and you can make a final decision. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to have complete trust in my talented team. We all have equal shareholding. And we'll go through why I think that trust is important as we go through this. Um, but it is important to me. But let's look at why you might want to listen to every word I say. Because you're looking at me at the moment going, who is this guy? Why should I listen to him? He could be an idiot who's never made a successful game before. So let me give you some reasons why I think you should listen to some of what we've learned. The first game we made, we made it in 16 weeks, end to end, with a team of five people having never made a mobile game before. And we punked it out into the world. And a number of things happened. One, it was editor's choice in 72 countries. Two, it won Macworld Game of the Year 2013. And most importantly, it had a million downloads in the first 10 days. And this was an indie team. We were in a big studio, but a big studio was work for hire. It wasn't used to doing user acquisition. It had never released its own IP mobile game before. This was a new thing for all of us, and it worked out pretty well. The studio said to us, 
your crazy little team did that. We now have 20 people who don't have work. Can you keep them busy for the next six months? We went, yeah, sure, we can do that. We made another game. We made a game called Paper Titans. Um, IGM rated it as 8.2, great. Um, the reviewer said, I'm not quite sure if I've ever seen a mobile game quite as pretty as Paper Titans. Um, this was where I first started working with Nick Williams, our current artist. If you look up Paper Titans, you might not like the gameplay, that's fine, but I don't think anyone will argue, even though this game's about 18 months old now, no one can argue quite how beautiful this game is. And again, the game came about because we trusted the team. When we first started working on this, all of my directors who I was on the previous project with said, yeah, it was fine, because you had a little team of four of you, you could create this cool indie spirit, you could build this excitement, you can come in and sit down. Okay. Um, but, um, so we, um, we started working with this bigger team, and they're like, how are we going to get them to have that same creative spirit? And guess what the word was we used? We said, well, just trust them. We said, we can make any game we want. Come up with a game idea. They sat and stared at us like rabbits caught in a headlight. But we worked with them, and by the end of the six months, the team had made this amazing game that reviewed really well and did really well. Again, oddly enough, 72 countries had it as editor's choice. As a team, and I can say this even now, we have never, ever worked on a game that hasn't been on the front page of the App Store. Our new game, Lumo Deliveries, launched yesterday, is on the front page of the App Store under best new apps around the world. If you go into the game section, it's got a banner across the top. I have never worked on a game that hasn't been featured by Apple. In a bit, I'll tell you how we do it. It's, it's a formula. It's, it's not rocket science. It's really easy, and I'm amazed more developers aren't doing it. I probably shouldn't keep telling people, because then everyone will do it, and it'll become harder for us. But it is easy to get featured. People think it's this weird, dark art. I was emailed by the App Store team whilst we were in soft launch saying, can we feature your game? Um, but let's start with how we do some of this stuff. We have a very unusual individual approach to making games in a team. So when we started making the game at the beginning of this year in January, I did two things. Number one, I bought the team this book. This book is one of the most inspiring books I've ever read about game development. If you look, it's a cookery book. But it's a cookery book for, I think, one of the most inspirational restaurants in the world. Um, maybe not including El Bulli, because it's not there anymore. But excluding El Bulli, one of the most inspirational restaurants in the world. The reason I got inspired by this book, and the reason I gave it to every single member of my team, is the approach that the chef had to creating his restaurant. And it goes into amazing detail. The introduction of this book is much more important than the recipes. The recipes are beautiful. You'll never make them. You'll need about a million pounds worth of, of, of um, gastronomic equipment to make them. But he set about making a restaurant. And the first thing he did is he thought about who was going to come into the restaurant and eat. Now, when you sat down at lunch earlier today, you probably sat down at the table, and there would be cutlery laid out. Often, if you go to a fine dining establishment, there'll be cutlery laid out for starter, main course, and dessert. You'll have a water glass and a wine glass, a charger plate. They're basically set up to give you a three-course dining experience with water and wine. And you might not want any of those. You might just want to have a starter. You might just want a coffee and a dessert. You might just want to skip straight to the main course. But the restaurant's already trying to prescribe what your experience is going to be. What they did at Mugritz, is said, we're going to throw that away. What we're going to do is we're going to, when the diner sits down at the table, the table's going to be blank. And as the diner starts ordering their food, we'll craft the experience around the diner. Then what they realized is by doing that, the diners got even more confused and would make some bad decisions. Some of the, the food on the menu is really experimental and they didn't know what it was, so they'd order dishes that didn't work well together. They'd order too much food or too little food. So now, if you go to Mugritz, you sit down at your table and you say, surprise me. And then they'll build an experience around you. If they've got um, a delivery of the most amazing tomatoes that have arrived that day and they can only serve three dishes, the first three diners will get those dishes. They build everything they've got about what's available to them and craft the experience around the diner. And that's what we want to do as a game team. We want to make experiences for the player. We put the player first, we make the player king, and every decision we make throughout our development process is with the player in mind. Not us, not our egos, not we want what we want, but what the player is going to want. Does that make sense? Um, to really drive this home to the team, the next thing I did is I took my crazy development team to a two Michelin star restaurant. 
This is my favourite restaurant in London by a country mile. One, because the food's incredible. Two, they do the best lunchtime offer I've ever seen. I keep saying to people, it's amazing value. It's like £45 a head, which sounds expensive. But it's two Michelin star, you get starter, main course, dessert, petit pot, a mousse bouche, and half a bottle of wine for £45. But more important than that, it's the theatre of the experience. It's not about the food. You go into the restaurant, and you go up a staircase that's like got neon artwork and neon lights in, but it's really black. You get up to the main entrance to the restaurant, the doors are closed, they push the doors open, and you then walk into this beautiful, vibrant, creative space. And that sense of excitement starts from the minute I open the door. I think we must have had, for the four of us who went to the restaurant, I think we had something like 10, maybe 15 different waiting staff service. They curated the experience. My artist said he felt like he was the star of a Stanley, his own Stanley Kubrick film. And you had this kind of amazing surreal experience. And two things come out of it. One, it got them thinking about everything we do, every tiny nuance and every tiny detail in the game, because that's what they do in fine dining establishments. And also, they've created a memory. Most of these guys have never been to a fine dining restaurant before, and they still talk about it 10 months later, saying, when can we go to Sketch again? When can we go, which fine dining restaurant are you going to take us to now? So we've kind of set an expectation. And what we then want to do is take those principles and those philosophies and apply them to the games we create. Thinking about, so this game was quite heavily constrained. We only had four people, I only had 2D artists. So we used that and thought about the details of how we were going to apply that to the player. We came with a ready formed idea of what the interactions would be on a touch screen. But what we're also known for as a team is our unusual art styles. Kumo Lumo got loads of critical acclaim because it didn't look like anything else on the App Store. As a team, we believe, it's part of our philosophy, that how the game looks is every bit as important to how the game plays. How the game plays is incredibly important because if your game is rubbish, people will not play it for very long. If your game looks beautiful, you'll get them through the shop door. They'll go, that looks amazing. Oh, it's rubbish, and they'll stop playing. So the two things have to work, but we put as much importance in the visuals for our game. What we also try and do is create a unique visual identity and heritage. If you look back at um, our three games, Kumo Lumo, Paper Titans, and Lumo Deliveries all look very different. They've got very unique and individual art styles, but they've got a shared heritage. They've got elements that you can see work together. So we took elements from the sticker bomb movement that inspired us for Kumo Lumo and applied that same kind of graffiti style to the way we created the levels. We then used the same kind of mix of 3D and 2D elements within our new game. So this is shared heritage. There's a language that people can buy into. But that doesn't come about by accident. When we first started talking about doing a delivery game, this is the first piece of concept art Nick came up with, um, and we were going to call it Adventurous Deliveries Inc., um, which seems like a rubbish name now. We're calling it Lumo Deliveries. But we looked at that, and we went, it's not very Lumo. It doesn't feel like it fits our identity of what we want to do. Then Nick created this, which we loved. Immediately we saw it. We thought it was striking, bold colors, really strong color palette. Um, but then at the same time, he showed us this little van with these little guys. And we said, can we have that and that? And Nick created that. And that was the bit where we as a team looked at that and we went, that's a game we want to make. That's a game that we want to play. It has our Lumo identity. It has the visual direction that's appealing and exciting for us. But it also, more than anything else, doesn't look like any other game we've ever seen. So when people see this, this becomes part of our marketing. Every screenshot anyone ever sees of our game, they immediately know it's from our game. How do they know that? Because our game name is in great big letters in the middle of the screenshot. So anytime anyone sees anything, they go, oh, that's an exciting looking game. That's interesting. Oh, and it's called that. I'll have to keep an eye out for it. So we use this early on as part of our marketing, building our brand. But we're a really unusual company because there's an interesting thing that lots of independent game developers don't like talking about, and it's the word money. I work in the games industry, and the key word here is industry. This isn't a hobby for me. This is how I want to learn, earn my living. I love making games. I'm lucky and privileged to be working in an industry where I get to make games for a living. But to do that, I need to make money from making games. And people don't like thinking about that when they start on a creative journey. But we like to look at that as a balance. And we'll show you some of the things that we do when we balance this. But we like to think that we work as a business brain and creative heart. 
We make creative decisions that no sane business person would ever make. We've got like beatniks and bongo playing and hypnosis, all these kind of things in our game. These aren't commercial decisions, they're creative decisions. The art style that we've gone for is not necessarily a commercial decision. It's based on what we want and what we're passionate about. But then we balance that by looking at how we're actually going to balance the books. How are we going to earn enough money so we get to carry on making games? We're not in this to become rich. I don't want to, well, I would like to become a millionaire overnight, but that's not my goal. My goal is to make enough money from this game that we can have a salary to make another game. And it's a reasonable salary. If we earn £30,000 each from this game, that would buy us about another year to make another game. And if we can keep doing that forever, then we can keep earning a reasonable living doing something we love. And that's what we're aiming for. People who think of games as a way of getting rich quick, and they're going to, I'm going to make a game and I'm going to suddenly become the, the next supercell and, and we're going to become really rich, more power to you. But don't believe that. Most indie developers I work with, I know, I used to, did a, spent a bit of time last year doing some publishing for indie guys. On average, a really good independent game released on the App Store with really good coverage makes about $10,000. And those games probably cost thirty dollars to $100,000 to make. It's not a great business if you're relying on banking on it. But if you approach it as a business, but keep your creative vision, you can make it work. Let me show you some of the ways how we do that. So, step one. Constrained creativity. What I mean by constrained creativity, if I say to you now, think of an amazing game idea, and you get this blank sheet, you go, I can't, I can't think of a game idea. I can't think of something amazing. You, people get stuck. We had to do this at the beginning of last week. I was asked to, to put together a pitch for a new round of investment because our investors are super happy with the game. They're really excited. You know, we're just, front page of App Store, you guys are great. We want to invest again. Have you got another game idea? We're like, no, um, but we'll come up with one. And this is the process we always use. We work in a box. I find in all of my years of working with creatives, if you give people constraints so they understand the boundaries of what they're working to, they can do amazing stuff. So for example, constraints we often work to a team and time. So I've got a team of four guys. The amount of money we get as investment probably gives us eight to 10 months to make a game. So whatever we do, going back to my food analogy again, we try and make games that we describe as kind of like contemporary cuisine. It's small and perfectly formed. If we try and make, we have a team of four people in 10 months, an online massive multiplayer game, we are going to fail. It will not be the quality we want it to be. It will be hard to find the bugs. It will be hard to test it. A couple of friends of mine on the same budget we're working to have made an amazing 3D shooter with multi-levels they are having a hell of a time to get the polish level to where they want it to be. If you make something small, you can polish it within an inch of its life. We finished our game probably after eight to ten weeks. We then spent the last eight months polishing the living daylights out of the game until it's beautifully formed player experience. We also think about the platform. We make games for Apple, we make games for iPhone and iPad. We do not make games for all of the other mobile platforms. We know this platform well. We know what we're going to do on it. We know the hardware, we know the audience. So that's what we make games for. And then we have goals. Normally every project we do as a team, we set ourselves some ambitions and some goals and some thoughts. So for example, our goal on this project was to create a game that we was about decisions and tactics rather than about skill and gameplay and to create a game you could play while you were doing other stuff. And that was one of our goals. But we set kind of goals. And once you know how many people you've got, how long you've got, the platform you're making it for, and the kind of experience you want to make it for, you can quickly go, well, here's some ideas about that. The game Lumo Deliveries fell out of a conversation where our, Jonathan Evans, our designer, said, I want to make a game about making decisions and tactics. And I, I'd seen an article about um, a game called Colony Play that was published by a company in Japan called Colopal that had become the uh, biggest uh, publisher in games in, in Japan overnight. We're doing geolocation games. I said, well, I want to do a geolocation game. We went, well, what's about geolocation? Well, delivering stuff's about ge geolocation. You can make decisions and tactics about where in the world you send your drivers. That was our game. So then we started working from there. And it took that original idea probably took us 15 minutes to come up with once we'd set all the parameters, and then we bounced, bounced it around until we got something we were all excited about. We did a similar process with our new game. We took, everyone just went out, we went out for a long lunch one day. 
worked out our parameters, bounced some ideas around, came up with a concept we liked, and then worked it up over the last week, and I sent it off to our investors last night. One of the key things we, th we often think about is not just who our audience are, but where they're going to play the game, what the game experience is. So like, you know, think of Flappy Bird. People would play the Flappy Bird at a bus station, in the toilet, but once you're on the train and you've got an hour to spare, you're probably playing something like XCOM or whatever the latest that is. This was, um, that's one of my favorite games. Um, but we think about that experience. What we want to do with Lumo Deliveries is um, create an experience that people could play in between other games. So you'd open it up, make a decision, you'd play the game for about 30 seconds, and you'd put it down again. Or you'd play XCOM, or you'd play Flappy Bird for a bit longer. You'd just play it at small increments throughout the day. And once we knew that, and we knew our players were going to be super, super casual, we then had to make some horrible, tough decisions. So we had this beautiful piece of key art that we all got excited about. And I remember when a designer said, but you know the game's going to have to be portrait. I was like, really? But it's going to look beautiful, landscape. And he went, yeah, but people who are trying to play a casual game, they just don't want to be turning their phone around. People are that lazy. They will not open your app if they have to turn the phone around. If they've got the phone in the hand in that orientation, open it up, make the decision, close it again, that's going to make life easier. Player first. So that's what our game ended up looking like. We turned the screen, and it was a tough decision. We wanted our game to look like that, but we had to do it in that kind of format. We also wanted our game to be a second screen game. And not a second screen game as the people on marketing tell you that, it's got, that it should be, that someone's going to want to play the X Factor game whilst they're watching X Factor on TV. People don't do that. People are looking on Facebook and Twitter while the TV's running in the background. And we wanted our game to be something that you could watch TV, make some decisions, watch TV a bit more, and it's not going to get in your way. You can look away from the screen and nothing bad would happen. And that was borne out by some early data that we looked at. Again, remember this kind of business brain thing. We make these kind of creative decisions, then we check. So this data from Flurry showed us that people play games or play, use their phone peak early in the morning, so 8, 9, 10, when people are commuting to work, then it flattens out. They then spike again at lunchtime, but by far the biggest spike is in the evening when people are at home. So we wanted a game that could be played while people were watching telly, but this also showed us that we wanted to probably cater for commuters and maybe something at lunchtime. So a game that you would pick up at key points in your day. The other side that people never really think about when they're doing the business of games is actually project management. It's kind of part of my job. When my team said, got together, people were saying, but why do you need a Steve? There's three of you, you don't need a project manager. Well, my job will help people manage the numbers. Let me just give you a quick, quick example. The numbers I'm going to give you are pretty much rubbish, but it means that I could do the mental arithmetic quite quickly. But you'll get the idea. If I've got four people working for eight months, and I have a cost of £8,000 per person, so that's probably a salary, salary of about three, three and a half thousand pounds a month, plus the cost of software and office accommodation, all the other costs, so about £5,000 a month. That means my project's going to cost £160,000 which is about 5,000 pounds a week. If I'm doing a free-to-play game and my average revenue per user is 15p, if my project overruns by one week, I need to get 33,000 users to cover that cost. And this is why timing of a project becomes important, particularly if you're doing free-to-play. But if it's not free-to-play, imagine you're selling your game for £1.50. For every week you overrun, you need to get 3,000 people to spend £1.50. That's still hard to do. So hitting deadlines, knowing your goals, and managing that process is important. Every week you overrun means you're less likely to actually be able to run this as a sustainable business. Yep. So you set your project up. You go, I'm going to spend... And even if you're working from home, you're spending money because it's your time. Your time is what you get paid for. Our time in life is probably one of the only things that's valuable in the modern economy. When you're going to spend, say, £100,000 of your time making a game, you want to know that you're going to get that money back and some return on it. And managing that process is important. So what we tend to do as a project team is we set at the very beginning what I call beats these kind of key milestones. They're not massive detail. I'm not saying exactly what we're going to deliver because creative process, you change your mind as you go through. But what we do is we sketch out the detail. So if I'm going to release a game in eight months, I want my first prototype at the beginning of the first month. I want my second prototype by the, end of, uh, by the beginning of the third month. Month five, I want to be feature complete. Month six, I want a soft launch. And then month eight, I want to launch. That's pretty much the project plan we work to on, on Lumo Deliveries. 
I have two prototypes. I expect to throw this away because you want to be wrong about a bunch of stuff. Being wrong is more important about being right because it helps you become right. I'll show you some of the stuff we did wrong in a bit. Once I know that, I can set the project management pyramid in my head so I know how much time I've got, how much the cost is of the project, what the scope is, and the quality we're aiming for. If anything happens in my project, so if I want to add a feature, something else is going to need to change. I'm either going to need more time, more money, or reduce the quality. Most likely what I try and do is reduce the features. What we tend to do is we work on a kind of agile scrum basis where we have a project backlog, we work through, we monitor our burn down, and if we're running over or we need to add more features in, we cut other features. We cut three quarters of the features that we planned on putting in Lumo deliveries to keep the quality higher and to keep it manageable. I actually believe the game's better for the features we cut out. This is our wall of scrum that we, we work to. Interesting reason I put this up is, again, about trust. All of the stuff in the backlog all has a priority number on it. And the people who are going to do the work wander up to the scrum, they take it, okay, this is the sprint, they move it into the doing column, and when it's done, they move it into the done column. I noticed one day that my artist was wandering up and taking lower priority tasks and doing those before the really high priority tasks. I thought, well, that's a bit odd. You should be doing the high priority tasks. That's more important. But I thought, no, I trust Nick. He's a great guy. I'm going to carry on and leave him do what he's doing, assuming he knows what he's doing. And I saw him do this consistently. But what he would be doing is whilst he's doing some kind of fun little task that he just got excited about, he's doing a van that we don't need for another eight weeks, he's thinking about the high priority task. And then he would sit down and do the priority task one hit. So he wasn't spending three weeks of his life reworking and reworking. He was thinking about it until he knew what he wanted to do, and then he'd do it once. And what I was getting in that process is rather than three weeks of iteration on one thing, I was getting loads of low priority things and then instantly getting the high priority thing. And the reason that he worked like that is because I trusted him to work like that. I didn't go, what are you doing, Nick? Why, you must do this. I trust him. Yeah? What's the point in employing and working hard to find amazingly talented people and then not trusting them to do the job that they're employed to do? It doesn't make sense to me. And then the final thing that we do a lot, I think I've got about 10 minutes left of what I'm talking. Yeah, I think. Take your time. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, is, have, has anyone here ever read the book called The Rhythm of Business? No? Yes? No? So, you know, everyone talks nowadays about the modern way of making games, where you make a game, you put it out into beta or soft launch, you listen to your audience, they'll tell you what they want, and then you keep iterating on it until it's perfect. Yeah, everyone knows that. That's, that's kind of the modern way that we all make games anymore. You don't just make a game once and put it out into the world and it's going to be perfect. Yep, everyone knows that? This book was written in about 91, and it said that this was the approach people should use in all walks of life, all businesses. I think the story it gives is the story of McDonald's. Apparently, the, I don't know how true this is, but I just like the story. Um, I've never researched it. Someone, if someone Googles it while I'm talking and you find out it's rubbish, don't tell me, because I like telling the story. But um, the story is, the guy who founded McDonald's, he started off selling milkshake machines. And he was selling milkshake, milkshake machines in his uh, local area, and he suddenly realized there were about five shops in the entirety of his area that he could sell milkshake machines to but there were about 100,000 people that he could sell milkshakes to. So he quickly thought, well, I'm going to stop selling milkshake machines, and I'm going to start selling milkshakes. And then customers started saying to him, these milkshakes are amazing, but I want something to eat with my milkshakes. And he thought, well, what do people like to eat? Ah, oh, I'll do burgers. I'll do burgers and milkshakes. And it kind of worked out right for him. Yeah, I think McDonald's has kind of done okay. And this was an approach people have been using for decades. This is not a new thing, but we still follow that same approach. We make a thing as quickly as we possibly can. We put it in the hands of our audience as fast as we possibly can. And those people will tell you what they like and what they don't like. And we try and take out the things they don't like and put in more of the things they do like. It's not rocket science. It amazes me. People, I do this talk a lot, telling people to do this. And they'll go, yeah, 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 we do this. And I say, well, how quickly in the process are you speaking to people and showing them your game? And they go, oh, we do it when we get to about beta. That's the problem. What we do is we design something. We implement it as quickly as we can. We test it by putting it in front of human beings. We assess what we learn, and then we do the process again. And we start doing this. Let me skip to here, here, and here. And then we carry on doing it all the way through. 
we create something. I remember the first build of the game we ever made. It didn't have any tutorials in. It barely had the functionality we wanted in. And my team were going, but why are we going to put this in front of people? I said, because we're bound to have done a bunch of stuff wrong. And I learned this the hard way years ago. We were working on one of the first round of launch titles for Connect. And when we were working on it, no one knew how someone was going to react trying to control a game without a controller. So we worked through loads of iterations in the studio. We had usability testing booked with a company called Player Research. Graham, who runs it, who I, he's a good friend of mine now, but um, I met him when we were working on this project. He used to keep phoning me up saying, are you ready for us to test it? Can, you, can we show this to people yet? And I'm like, we're nearly ready. We'll be ready in a few weeks. We're nearly ready. And then what would happen is we'd get it into the user testing and stuff that we'd been iterating on for three months and put loads of time, effort, money in would be completely wrong. And we'd bin it and we'd bin three months of work. If we'd shown it to them as soon as we had it working, we could have saved ourselves loads of money because we could have learned what was rubbish when we first started. Yeah, makes sense. So when you make something, show it to people as quickly as you can. The rest of the stuff I'm about to go through is pretty much all about stuff we learned about our game. So it's probably handy if you know a little bit about how our game works. It's really simple. We've got other screens, but our core game loop runs through three screens. You have a depot. On your depot, you have driver's vehicle's jobs. The jobs are all real world locations, and it takes a real amount of time for that job to be delivered in the world. So you choose a driver, a vehicle, and a job. You see how much money you're going to earn and how long it's going to take. So this job, I'm going to earn 500 Lumo bucks. It's going to take six minutes to complete. This is a screen that terrifies people because our game is a timer-based game. We actually show the players the timers pretty much as little bars by the, seeing the vehicles going along. I remember showing it to publishers. They went, oh my god, are you, you're being really too open about the game as a timer game. Well, if people don't like timer games, they're going to hate our game. It's all about timers. Um, so this is the screen where you can see all of your journeys, how long they're going to take, and when you get your money. When your vehicle arrives, you then click on little boxes to make your delivery. You earn money that goes back in so you can expand your fleet. And that's pretty much our game. Like I said, super tiny that we've spent loads of time polishing. So now you know what our game is, let's look at some of the things we learned. So month one, we put the game into usability testing. This is pretty much what the game looked like in month one. Yeah, it's not pretty, it's not sexy, but we knew we'd learn stuff. We spent a lot of time prototyping our UI on paper so we could make the decisions cheaply without putting code. One of the things we spent most of our time doing, players go, wow, your game is really easy to play. It's really easy to choose a vehicle driver job and know how much money I'm going to earn. When we started doing this, we didn't know what, important was, what information was going to be important to our players. What information did you need to make that kind of correct decision? So we spent a lot of time creating these, showing it to people, and finding out. So it seems obvious in hindsight that people want to know how much they're going to earn and how long it's going to take. It took three or four iterations of showing the game to people before we understood that was important to them. Yeah, maybe we're stupid. Um, but this is the first prototype we put into playtesting, so we could understand how people felt about the game. This is a really odd thing. What we learned from this is people, even when we just had these little gray bars that filled up, people loved this screen they would sit on this screen and wait for little bars to fill up. So all we did was make that, we weren't gonna put that in the game, but people loved it, so we put it in the game and just made it look pretty. Yep, listen to your audience. Um, prototype two, we went back into usability testing. What we learned here, again, super obvious in our game, you choose your vehicle and drivers by swiping left and right. Um, no one understood that. We had someone play our game for 20 minutes before they realized they had to swipe. People poke, not swipe. By doing this testing early, this was a disaster that we could avoid. If we hadn't tested this, we could have got millions of one-star reviews as our game went out to market and no one could play it. And everyone went, this is rubbish. By knowing this early, this is a thing that people often say, well, I can't, can't put a game out until I've got the tutorial in. We believe it should be the other way around. If you go out to your players and watch your players play your game, you know what information you need to put in your tutorial because you can see what players understand and what they don't understand. By the time we got to feature complete, we were pretty happy with ourselves. We thought we'd created an amazing game. Then we were lucky enough to have an appointment with a lady called Rachel Roth at Apple, who's one of Apple's two usability UI UX evangelists. She is an amazing lady. If you ever get the opportunity to meet her and get a one-to-one -one session with her, 
grab it with both hands. She spoke at us for 53 minutes of truth and told us all the stuff that was wrong with our game. We didn't say, no, Rachel, you're playing our game wrong. We shut up, we listened, and we did everything she told us to do. And guess what? Our game got better. Um, here's a bunch of really simple things. Um, so, see all these little icons on the bottom? They took you to all these different menus in the game. No one understood it. People kept poking them and getting confused and lost. We now have two buttons in our game. Makes it much easier for people to understand. Um, one of Rachel's great suggestions, we, on, this on this little conveyor belt, it continually scrolls. You couldn't tell when you'd gotten past the job you started looking at. So we have this little break in. It's a tiny little detail, but it makes a big difference to the player experience. We have the same thing for the vehicles and the drivers. Um, I, I'll tell you a really blindingly obvious thing. Hopefully everyone won't do this. When we soft launched our game, we found our conversion wasn't very good for our um, in-game currency. If you look at the little in-game currency, our coffee cup, you'll notice it's missing a little plus button. No one knew they could press on it. We added a little plus button, more people bought in-game currency. There's a revelation. If you show your players that something's pressable, they will more likely press it. Um, we have an approach that we call, has everyone heard of the 50 cups of coffee method? If you have an idea, don't keep your idea secret. Go and have coffee with friends and tell them your idea over coffee. Don't do it all in one day. I'm not telling you you should have 50 cups of coffee today. I know I'm speaking quite quickly. I've had quite a lot of coffee, but not 50 cups of coffee. Don't have 50 cups of coffee in one day. Spread it over a period of time, but do get an idea and tell it to your friends. Because the more people you tell, one, you're getting feedback on your idea. They'll tell you whether it's good or rubbish. And guess what? You'll even get better at telling people about your idea as well. Yep. And the more frequently you do this, the better you'll get at it. It becomes an important part of the process. This is an example of this. One of the cups of coffee that I had was with my friend Graham McAllister, who runs Player Research. And I'm lucky he's a friend of mine, and he can't help. Does anyone here know Player Research or Graham? If you're ever at a conference, his... his Graham won't thank me for telling you this, but um, Graham and his team are, I believe, the world's experts in usability. They only do game usability. But here's something, and they're quite expensive because they're very good, but Graham can't help but give you feedback about your game. If you see him, say, oh, hi, Graham. Um, I was told to come and speak to you. I've got a game I'm making. Here's my game. And you will get free usability testing because he can't help himself but critique your game. So if you're ever at a conference and you see him, Stick your game in his hands. This is what he did to us. We had our game, we were finished. We thought it was brilliant. I was having my, one of my 50 cups of coffee with Graham, going, here's our game, isn't it amazing? And he went, so what do I do? I said, well, you do deliveries, you earn money, so you can, um, so you can earn more money. He's like, yeah, but why? I said, well, so you can build a bigger fleet. And he's like, but why? I said, well, so you can earn more money and earn a bigger fleet. And he said, but yeah, but why? And I was like, oh yeah, okay. So this is where we had to put in a whole new feature one month from launch where we've now got a whole map that your whole thing in the game is global domination, and by delivering to all the countries in the world, you dominate the world. You now have a reason. Our game's a game about global domination. We didn't have that. It was just a little delivery game. We would have missed that had I not been on my track for 50 cups of coffee. This presented us with a problem, because I was adding features really late in the project. So what I had to do was cut something. What we did was cut scope and add a bit more time. I used all of our budget just to get that one feature in. My programmer hated me. He's like, but Steve, we're a month from launch. You shouldn't be adding in a massive feature. I, went, I know, but our game won't succeed if we don't do it. And sometimes it's that important. When, you make your, when you're doing work for hire work, guess what? I shouldn't say this, but just good enough is sometimes just good enough. If your client is happy and they pay you, that's fine. If you're doing your own games, your own IP, Good enough isn't good enough. It has to be exemplary. So you will make bad decisions. You will cause people stress because you want your game to be better. Sometimes you have to do it. Soft launch, great. We were out in soft launch. We learned a bunch of stuff from data. Most important, anyone who tells you different to this is lying. The most important thing in a free-to-play game is retention, making a good game. You can have all of the money. If, if you've got 
if you've got all of the players in the world coming and playing your game, if you say our most important thing is user acquisition and you acquire 10 million players and they all play your game for 30 seconds, you're not going to do very well. If you get 100 players and those 100 players play your game forever, you'll probably do better. Yep. So the most important thing in any game is fix retention first. There's a thing, um, I used to work in sales. We used to have this thing called sales pipeline, where the whole idea is you've got a funnel. You tip water in the funnel, and you've got a pipe. And if stuff's leaking out of your pipe, you're losing it. And the amount that gets to the end is what's important. So you want to be patching all of those leaks. So everyone who comes through your front door gets the best experience they can. And then, once you've kept them, you can work out how to make money from them, because they're enjoying your game. Yeah? So put all of your effort into retention. Let me show you some of the things we learned. Um, number one um, thing that we learned is we, we have vehicles that you can upgrade and buy in the game. It's great. We thought people would love upgrading and buying vehicles. What it turned out when we looked at the data is that people like drivers more. What we found was, and these are all our, so let me backtrack one slight step. Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. I can do this in five minutes. If we backtrack one step, we're a small team of five people, I do, or four people. I do not have a team of analysts analyzing our data. I analyze our data, and we have one designer to tweak our data. So we designed the game from the ground up that we could look at four simple metrics and make decisions about our game. Metric one, how far people can deliver to, which is denoted by which vehicles they own. So we saw people would get as far as level four. They, could do, they would buy vehicle four but they weren't going to vehicle five. We had a massive drop off at vehicle five. This is disappointing. This is killing our retention. Um, but then we noticed something really odd. 73% of people were upgrading and getting to driver number four really quickly. They were spending all of the money they were earning doing jobs on hiring drivers, which is fine. It showed they really liked the little drivers. But the problem we were having is the early jobs, the early vehicles you have, last between 30 seconds to two minutes. And if all you're doing are those jobs, our game gets really boring and really repetitive really quickly. Our aim was we want to get people into jobs where you're leaving your game alone for an hour or two at a time. That's the whole point of a timer-based game, is get people out of your game while they're still enjoying it and haven't got bored. They weren't doing that. They were sitting in this tight loop, getting bored and leaving our game. So we fixed it really easily. We made Sylvia 10 times more expensive. It made people have to go and upgrade vehicles so they could do the longer, more um, valuable jobs before they could go back and buy another driver. Fixed our retention, kind of. Um, what we found, going through this cycle, test, implement, assess again, is we saw this. Yay, nice jump in people getting to level five. Oh my God, no one's getting to level six. And the reason they weren't doing that is because of principle we call Lumo Bucks Per Minute, one of our other metrics. We pay people a certain amount of money for the amount of time they invest in playing our game. Yep. That's our Lumo Bucks that they earn per minute. And we found that the Lufo, really expensive vehicle, ten, over 10 times the price of the previous vehicle, was only earning them twice as much money. And so people were saving up, getting to the Lufo, going, this is rubbish, I'm not earning much money. We weren't giving our players good value for money. So we now give them 20 times the value when they get this. They play our game, they invest time, we give them great value in Lumo bucks per minute. Again, fixed our retention. Make sense? Just looking at your players. Another thing that we found is our tutorial. We looked at our tutorial. Every step, we could see where we were losing players. Every time we found a step in our tutorial where we were losing an unusually high amount of players, we looked at that step, we worked out why, we fixed it. Um, and that's kind of me done. The only other thing that about trust is we work in a shared workspace in Leamington Spa called the Arch Creatives. And it's what I believe is the future of game development. Because when we worked in a big studio, it was amazing. Because you're surrounded by loads of creative talents you could have your 50 cups of coffee with really easily because the person was sat next to you. You could tell them your idea, they'd give you feedback. When you become an indie, it's easy to lose that because you're working from your bedroom or you're working just two of you in an office. We created a shared workspace to have that. We get the benefit. We're surrounded by other independent game developers who were all sharing our ideas. We're sharing even our contacts at first party. We had Valve come into our office and have a look around. So we kind of create a buzz that it's hard to do when you're just one person. The downside that we were told by this is that people could steal your game idea. Guess what? 
Ideas are worthless. Yeah, we can come up with ideas all of the time. Execution's important. And as creative people, I don't want to make your idea. I want to make our idea, because it's going to be cooler than your idea. And you'll do the same. You know, so we trust people not to steal our ideas. We trust people not to leak information. And guess what? It works. Yeah? Trust is important. And that's kind of, I think, the moral. is So the square, constrained creativity. The triangle, the pillars of project management. If you change something, something else has to change. The cycle of iteration to make sure you're constantly getting evaluation information. And trust. Trust the people you work with to do an amazing job. Trust your friends to tell you when your game isn't good. And then just make great games. That's me done. <laughs>